Okay. Oh, yeah, it's, it's not on the If you're going to manage both, I think that's fine. Can you connect maybe this device? Uh, no, because we're sharing. The zone is also okay. Yeah, no worries. Um, just um, we're just trying to figure out the notes and how to bring it in English. Like, Okay, yeah. Okay. Uh, today's first uh, talk is by Ahmed Dainemi, and he is a computer, computer science bachelor student from Germany. He is doing an exchange year here in Zurich. Uh, he is interested in computer architecture, but particularly in hardware security, which he will be talking more about in this presentation. Uh, he is going to present this paper called Hardware, which was presented in using security. Uh, 2022, I guess that's all. Thank you very much. It's not now. Yeah. Um, so good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Ahmad. And today, I would like to tell you something about a class of side channel, channel attacks called Hertzpli. Um, the paper I will discuss today um, was published in 2022 under the title uh, Turning Power Side Channel Attacks into Remote Timing Attacks on um, Intel x86 Recesses. And um, let's start by having a look at the uh, as a quick summary of my presentation. So um, the authors of the paper observed that on modern Intel uh, recessors and also AMD processors, which uh, however they did not examine in the paper, uh, power side channel attacks can be turned into remote timing attacks that can be mounted even without um, any access to power measurement interfaces. Uh, which means those attacks can be uh, mounted remotely by a remote attacker over the network. Um, they also observed that um, variations in CPU frequency, um, which are induced by the so-called dynamic voltage and frequency scaling, DBFS, um, depend on the current power consumption and hence on the data being computed on, since it's well known that uh, power consumption is usually depends uh, on the data. Um, they also observed that uh, CPU frequency variations um, can be observed by remote attackers because those variations can sometimes get amplified by, uh, by, by the uh, cryptographic algorithms and can then translate to um, variations in execution time, uh, which can be used to infer sensitive information, for example, about the secret key that are used uh, in a cryptographic algorithm. And the goal of this um, paper was to first reverse, uh, um, re reverse engineer the dependency between data, frequency, and power consumption on mainly modern x86 um, CPUs. Um, they also described a novel uh, so-called chosen hypertext attack um, against a post quantum key encapsulation algorithm called uh, PSYC, which stands for super singular isogeny um, key encapsulation. Um, and chosen cyber ciphertext simply means that um, the attacker here can uh, can choose ciphertext that's, the, that's then submitted to the um, encryption or decryption algorithm. Um, and um, yeah, by doing so, um, the attacker can, for example, influence the way the cryptographic algorithm decrypts this uh, cybernetics, which was exploited in the, the attack versus the attack. So um, the approach they followed to achieve this goal was actually 
to um, kind of um, bridge the, the gap between timing attacks and power side channel attacks um, and to turn power side side channel attacks, which would otherwise run attacks to our vigilant interface, into timing attacks that can be mounted remotely um, uh, without, uh, without requiring uh, physical access to the device that's being targeted. And the key results of the paper were first um, the attackers, or which are in this particular scenario, actually the authors of the paper, um, were able to successfully recover a full secret key of, that's used in this psych algorithm to uh, decrypt ciphertexts. Um, and this also um, kind of expands the surface attack of uh, power side channels attacks. Um, because it shows that the, this kind of attacks can also be done without um, uh, without physical access to, to device and without also access to power measurement interfaces, uh, which kind of uh, requires a, a rethinking of uh, constant time programming and power solution. Um, so uh, quick look at the outline. First, I will give you um, some background information that will make it easier to understand the topic. After that, we will um, take a look at the frequent, frequency leakage model, uh, which was kind of um, examined in detail in this paper as preparation for the attack. Um, after that, we will look at the methodology that was followed by the attackers to, uh, mount, the, to mount the attack. And after that, we will dive um, into the attack itself and see which vulnerabilities were actually exploited by the uh, by the authors uh, to um, to mount this attack. After that, we will also, since we're talking about security issue here, actually vulnerability, uh, we should also talk about possible mitigations to prevent such kinds of attacks or at least make them um, as uh, unprobable as possible. Um, and at the end, I will um, give an overview about uh, strengths and weaknesses that I personally uh, considered to be strengths and weaknesses. They may not be generalized, generalizable, but yeah, to me personally. And at the end, we will discuss about some questions which I will touch upon in the presentation part. So let's dive right into some background. Um, power sign channel attacks, as you can see here, um, aim, to extract, aim to extract sensitive information. Um, such as cryptographic keys uh, by analyzing the power consumption of, of the target device. So they kind of try to extract um, information about um, about the data that's, uh, that's being computed on by an encryption algorithm uh, by analyzing data dependent uh, variations, for example, in, uh, in the frequency or execution time. Um, and uh, those kinds of attacks can be exploited both either uh, by uh, uh, direct access to hardware or also using uh, software power measurement tools, power measurement tools. Um, pause attacks, as I said, require physical access to the device. However, today's uh, attack, today's uh, power side channel attacks um, can also be done using uh, software power measurement spaces. So um, as you can see here, um, the power side channels, channel attacks um, allow to infer quite fine grained information or um, information about changes in a program's execution time, whereas remote timing attacks can only infer quite uh, coarse grained um, changes in the program's execution time. Uh, and this third split attack we're going to talk about today uh, kind of bridges the gap, the gap between power side channel. Uh, channel attacks and remote timing attacks um, by turning power side channel attacks into remote timing attacks that can be um, mounted remotely. Um, so, um, a very important concept um, that was actually exploited in the hertz split attack uh, is called dynamic voltage and frequency scaling. You might have heard of it. This is actually a, a technique that's used to adjust the CPU frequency to um, up to, to both reduce the power consumption when the workload is low and uh, otherwise, um, for example, increase the frequency when the workload is high in order to um, meet the uh, computation requirements um, 
as, as efficiently as possible and to uh, overall optimize the performance and the power consumption of the system. Um, and here is a formula that shows the relationship between um, frequent between frequency, voltage, and power consumption. And one important thing that um, uh, you can see here is uh, that the, both the frequency and the, the voltage uh, are directly proportional to the power consumption, which means that increasing, for example, the frequency or the voltage while keeping the all other parameters constant uh, will lead to an increase in the power consumption. And this means we can kind of play uh, play around with those, those parameters. We can, for example, um, uh, increase the frequency and decrease um, the, the, the voltage while keeping the power consumption constant. Um, yeah, I think this is this one yeah, might help to understand the uh, to understand this uh, dependency between frequency and power consumption um, better. Um, so um, second here you can see a um, figure that shows uh, the frequency at which your processor runs over time. Um, and here you can see at the beginning the frequency the, the processor starts to run at the maximum possible frequency in the max turbo state, that's a frequency of around 4.5 gigahertz. And after um, eight seconds, the frequency gets uh, scaled down, throttled down to a so-called steady state frequency, which then oscillates um, between 3.9 and 4.0. Uh, this frequency is then kept for the reminder of the calculation. And um, the bar that's going to be crucial for the attack is actually uh, this part here, the, the steady, start, uh, steady state uh, frequency part, because this was um, the frequency range that allowed the attackers to infer information about the data of the process, or more particularly, actually, about the secret uh, that was used in the encryption model. Um, here you can um, See a relationship between frequency and time. It's actually um, uh, important to know that frequency and time are uh, and time are actually um, equivalent. Equivalent. Um, so by having by running the processor at a higher frequency, um, we can finish a computation more uh, faster. Um, and you can see here, for example, if you, if you run the processor at a frequency of six point um, zero. Um, we then the computation only takes um, half the time it takes to finish the, the exact same computation when the trans has to of 3.0 gigahertz. <laughs> and this means that um, frequency depends on time and vice versa, and that this relationship can be explained and for information about the computations being done. So the main takeaway the main take away here is that uh, the execution time. Um, for a certain computation depends on the CPU frequency. And the CPU frequency, again, depends on the power consumption. And we also know that the power consumption depends uh, on the data being computed by the double. Uh, we will see that um, data that have um, higher hamming weight, which means like more, uh, a lot larger number of ones, um, uh, consumes more power than data that have uh, lower hamming weight. And, um, in like transitively, uh, this leads to the fact that the execution time of the program depends on the data being programmed on. So here, just for the sake of um, terminology, um, in the paper, uh, the authors quite often uh, talk use the term P states, and B states um, are nothing but actually um, voltage frequency pairs. Um, you can think of it here simply as Frequency, uh, because we were we will never talk about voltage today, um, and um, it's important to know that uh, dynam dynamic voltage and frequency scaling in Intel processors um, operates at the granularity of um, um, p states. Um, that's why it's important to mention this uh, term here, and we can have uh, different p states. Um, depending on the CPU model, they can either be managed, managed by the operating system or by the processor using, uh, uh, when we use the operating system, then we usually use so-called feedback coordination registers to, to manage these states. Um, the range depends on the number of active cores, and um, for you, it's just important to keep in mind that um, the lowest possible these states 
at least it corresponds to the minimum frequency to the lowest possible frequency, whereas the highest state corresponds to the um, maximum possible frequency to the max total frequency that is um, in this particular scenario. Um, so another important um, concept uh, that we would like to is the concept of weight. Having weight simply refers to the number of one bits in a binary sequence or in a data work. Um, and it kind of helps to quantify the amount of information that is stored in a binary sequence. Um, here, for example, we can see a binary sequence that um, has one in the first, second, fourth, uh, uh, sixth, and seventh bit. That's why it has a Hemingway of uh, five. And um, in the so-called Hemingway linkage model, we will see that uh, the Hemingway, uh, or that the, the power consumption, depends on the Hemingway that they are being used on. Um, in other words, we'll see that data with larger Hemingway consume more power than data with lower Hemingway. Uh, another concept that's uh, highly related to the, the concept of uh, Hemingway that was also attributed to you, uh, was also named after the same mathematician, Richard Hamish is the concept of having a distance, which simply refers to the number of positions at which bits in two bit streams differ. And you can think of it as the number of bit flips that are necessary to uh, transfer bit and binary sequence into another binary sequence. For example, uh, if you think of the LU, you can think of it as difference in, as the difference in bits uh, between the LU input and the LU output. Um, here we have a simple example where uh, we can see that uh, those, uh, those uh, bit, bit strings um, are different, different in the second position and the last and the uh, second last one. Um, that's why we have having a distance of uh, three here. And the having a strings leaks model will see that the uh, power consumption and hence the frequency uh, depends on the number of one to zero and zero to one transitions uh, of the data being uh, computed on. Um, so just a very high level overview about the SI algorithm, because this is actually the algorithm that was targeted in the first fleet attack. Um, SI stands for a super singular isogeny uh, key encapsulation, and it's a post quantum uh, algorithm uh, which is meant to be secure against um, attacks from quantum computers. And the security algorithm uh, is actually based on the hardness of finding a mathematical mapping or so called isogeny um, between two elliptic curves. You might have heard the term elliptic curves from the field of elliptic uh, curve cryptography. Uh, we will not go into that much detail about the logic curves today, uh, not the focus of this presentation. However, I think it is important to just have an overview about the algorithm. Uh, this algorithm is believed to be um, highly efficient, and uh, that's why I think it's one of the four candidates for the NIST and standard, standardization process uh, for post quantum cryptographic algorithms. And it has both short ciphertext and short public keys and um, has also low commutation, commutational uh, communication uh, costs. Um, and yeah, we, here we can see um, an anxiety, uh, two elliptic curves. This is actually an elliptic curve. And anxiety is, as I said, simply a mapping that uh, transfers points from one elliptic curve to another. And here you can see the, the, the additivity uh, characteristic of an anxiety, which is, I think, which is simply a homomorphism, um, which says that um, adding the images of two points is equivalent or equal to taking the uh, image of the sum of two points. So now let's have a look at the frequency linkage model that paved the way for this attack. Um, the authors first wanted to examine if running different workloads or a different instruction. Uh, affect the power consumption of the frequency. And to do so, they picked uh, two workload, uh, workloads from a benchmark suite. Uh, the first workload only consists of um, 32, um, uh, consists of 32 integer and floating points 
operations, which means that it is computationally more expensive uh, than the seeking workload, which uh, only consists of uh, 32 bit integers. Um, and in order to distinguish data, um, they um, they used uh, they monitored the CPU frequency while executing this the exact same instruction, which means here in the second case um, we had only a different data but not different instructions. Uh, they only changed the content of the input registers and the the operation that was used here in particular in particular was a shift left uh, operation. Uh, which uh, simply shifts all of it in a binary sequence to the left. Um, and this was uh, the goal of this of the second experiment was to see if the frequency leaves information about uh, the data being processed. And here we can see um, the results of both uh, tests. Uh, as you can see, first in, in the int 32 test, um, the frequency starts at um, a at maximum level um, of 4.5 gigahertz, gigahertz and then uh, gets throttled to a steady state frequency after a certain number of seconds, which is in this particular case 10 seconds. Um, whereas in the int 32 flow test, where we had both integer and floating point operations, um, this drop to, from the maximum frequency to the steady state frequency uh, occurred uh, earlier. And another observation that was made here is that uh, the state state frequency the processor uh, runs at after this drop um, is higher for uh, the for the uh, integer test integer operations test than for the integer and operations. And the key takeaway here is that both the time the processor can stand at the maximum possible frequency. As well as the distribution of these states or the frequencies um, at steady state depend on the CPU power consumption, and um, this will uh, this will allow us to infer sensitive information um, about the the secret keys of the cycle. Um, Another experiment that was done um, was to examine if, uh, how the hemming weight of the data word affects uh, frequency and power consumption. Um, and they found that uh, the larger the hemming weight, uh, the longer the frequency stayed at the lower, at the lower steady state, and the quicker it drops uh, from the maximum frequency to the steady, uh, steady state frequency. And they also found that uh, processing on data of large hemming weight uh, consumes more power. As we can see here, for example, um, for HW refers to hemming weight here. And for example, for a data work that has 48 ones, the probability is higher that the frequency uh, will stay around 4.3. Um, than it is, for example, for a data work that only has 60 ones. And this uh, similar behavior that we observed here for the um, for the time it took the algorithm until it got uh, throttled, and we can see that for data words with higher hemming weights such, such as uh, 48, this time is shorter than for uh, data words with uh, smaller hemming. And uh, the key takeaway here is that uh, the distribution of these states depends on the CPU power consumption. And CPU power consumption again depends on the workload, which means that the distribution of the states of the frequency depends on the workload. And um, since those variations in frequency are actually induced by the dynamic voltage and frequency scaling technique we have talked about before, um, we can conclude that this uh, UVFS technique leaks information about the current workload, about the, the kind of operation. Uh, that are being executed by the system. So now uh, let's take a look at uh, the so-called Hemming distance and Hemming weight effect. Um, and the goal here was first um, with respect to, to the Hemming distance effect to um, understand the number of 1001 transitions affect um, power consumption. And to do so, they implemented an instruction center program that executes um, uh, different sets of operations. 
Um, in this particular case, the operations were shift left and shift right operations uh, that were meant to produce different uh, Hamming distances. And in a second case where they wanted to examine the Hamming weight effect, um, they um, executed, they uh, wrote a program that executes an all operation on two registers with the same content, which means that the output of the operation was uh, always the same. However, the input of the operation was varied. The input of both registers um, um, is varied uh, by increasing the number of handy weights uh, of the input registers. And here we can see the results for the Hamming distance effect. Um, they found that um, the, uh, the more bit shifts we have, uh, the higher the power consumption and the, uh, uh, the, the lower and uh, the higher the power consumption and the lower the frequency. Um, as you can see here, um, just as a simple uh, example, um, we have this data word. Um, and if we shift it by two positions to the left, then um, those two bits will change as well as those two bits here, um, resulting in a total of four for the Hamming distance. Whereas if we shift the exact same data byte, the uh, exact same data word by four bits to the left, um, then we get the Hamming distance of eight because both the first four bits will change as well as the second four bits will change. And Count here simply uh, refers to the number of bits that uh, by which the, uh, the binary sequence was shifted. And you can see um, the more, um, the larger the count was, which means the larger the Hamming distance, uh, the higher the power consumption uh, gets and the lower the digits. Um, and you might ask yourself why does actually um, having a higher Hamming weight or Hamming distance um, um, result in a higher power consumption? And a quite simple explanation for that is that uh, when we have a higher uh, Hamming distance, then we also have a higher, um, we also have more bit shifts. And having more bit shifts means that more transistors have to switch in the LU. Uh, my project here. And um, having more transistors that switch from one state to another um, increases the dynamic power consumption, and the dynamic power consumption makes up a significant part of the total power consumption of the of computation unit. So um, the key takeaway here is that um, the higher the number of bit shifts, the higher the power consumption and the lower the frequency. Um, and this means that, um, yeah, a higher number of bit shifts um, actually means higher hands. Um, so another experiment that uh, the authors did was to um, examine if um, ch changing the number of consecutive bits in a binary sequence affects the power consumption or the frequency. And actually, they got a quite similar result, uh, result uh, that show that um, even if the, the bits that are set to one are consecutive in the data work, um, the power consumption will get higher uh, the larger the, the more bits are set to one. And uh, however, you might uh, notice in kind of a bow here, bow shape in the line, um, which uh, suggests that. And it's important to know that the, the blue line here refers to the most significant bits, um, and the, the orange one to the uh, the blue one to the least significant, and the orange one to the most significant bits. And um, this uh, the observed observation suggests that uh, uh, bits in the most significant bits, like ones in the most significant bits have a higher Hamming weight effect, like higher, um, higher um, a larger impact on frequency and power consumption than um, bits in the least significant uh, bits. And uh, actually, uh, the exact same behavior was also observed for, observed for non-consecutive bits, which means uh, even if the bits are not uh, consecutive, uh, the higher the, the, the frequency will get uh, lower um, if we increase the number of consecutive ones and the power consumption will become higher. 
And they also verified that those both effects can be um, can be observed um, separately, but they are also additive in the sense that they uh, might also simultaneously contribute to the power consumption. Um, and um, for example, the if you look at the figure here, A, B, C, and D were source registers with uh, different bit patterns, and um, if we take C as an example, um, C has uh, ones in the first two bytes, in the first uh, four bytes. Um, and what they did is um, they um, calculated the Hamming distance between uh, the source register C and another register, which was first set, set to all zeros, and then uh, the number of um, the number of ones in this register um, got uh, increased. And you can see when the the, lot, the more ones we have in a in a second register, the smaller the Hamming distance becomes between this uh, bit string and the other bit string. And um, this effect can be observed up until the uh, fourth bit. And after that, um, the Hamming distance starts to increase again because here we have all zeros, and in the other register we will, we will have all ones. This can be seen here where the uh, frequency first increases um, due to lower Hamming uh, distance, and after bit four, it again starts uh, to decrease. So, um, I think summary so far we have seen that both the Hamming weight as well as the Hamming effect uh, contribute to power consumption and to frequency. They are, they can be. Uh, Observed uh, so separately, they all can also simultaneously contribute, contribute to the power consumption. And the hardware uh, Hamming weight effect is non uniform in a sense that um, uh, not only the number of uh, one bit in a binary sequence contributes to the uh, power consumption of the frequency, but also um, the, the, the position of those ones have an impact of the power consumption, which means. As you can see, ones in uh, the most significant bits have larger impact on power consumption than ones uh, in the list. Um, so, and related to our topic today, which is actually about a uh, hardware attack, um, these results mean that um, uh, when we compute and they code different bit patterns that are related to security that is used. In the, in the graphic algorithm will result in different power consumption patterns um, related to this secret key. And this can be used as a, as a side channel to um, recover the secret key in, in an extreme scenario. Uh, so let's have a quick look at the methodology that was followed uh, to do the experiments. The uh, authors tested six uh, CPUs. Um, they tested actually the Hamming weight and having this effect on six CPUs um, with different base frequencies and different uh, massive of frequencies. Um, they used a system uh, open to as a rating system with all uh, uh, micro batches installed, uh, default system configuration. They used um, uh, those registers to monitor the CPU frequency and this um, Register to what I'm after the, the power of something. Um, then the, the target server, the targeted, um, run, runs on a CPU um, for I7. And they actually targeted two different implementations of Psy um, from two different libraries. The first library is uh, Circle, which is a um, library from Cloudflare. Um, which operates an HTTP uh, server written in Go. The second library is written by a Microsoft EQ crypto library, um, where we have an a, a TCP server written in Go. Um, and um, they kind of uh, exploited a dummy effect to uh, recover the full key bit by bit. And it's also uh, by simply sending requests to the server. And then measuring the time uh, it takes to get the responses back from the server. 
And it's also interesting to know that, um, that the key has actually a, like a total length of 378 bits. Um, but uh, they it recovered the last 14 bits using the of search uh, due to um, the observation that I will touch upon later when I talk about the attack. So now let's dive into the um, attack itself. Um, the authors observed that when we revive the site decapsulation algorithm with specially crafted input, um, or in other words, with specially crafted ciphertexts, because the, the function of the algorithm is actually to get rid of the ciphertext it gets from the client um, to um, extract a shared secret key that's been used for, for uh, further communication with the client. And found that um, for special graph ciphertext, the decapsulation algorithm reduces anomalous zeros and gets stuck. And then, uh, as soon as one anomalous zero is produced, um, all subroutines of this algorithm reduces and uh, operates only on zeros for the reminder of the calculation. And um, as you have seen, um, of computing on zeros mean that we are uh, we are computing on data with lower Hamming weight and also lower Hamming distances. Um, this means that the computation will take short and wide wall, uh, wall time, and this is a side channel that can be exploited to um, extract uh, to extract uh, information about the um, bits that are being computed on by the server. Um, so the, the goal of the authors was to extract the secret key that was used by the victim uh, server to get her cipher text and establish a shared secret key with the client. Um, and they used a so-called adaptive chosen cipher text attack where uh, they as attackers uh, constructed the cipher text that was sent to the server. And um, so and um, for each and every bit of those 378 bits, they constructed a special ciphertext, uh, which was then used to specifically uh, recover this bit. And um, by exploiting this domino effect that uh, as soon as you know the first bit of the key, you can construct the ciphertext in a way that makes it possible to, work, to uh, recover the second bit and then having reco recovered the second bit, you can recover the third one so far, um, they could, um, after around 40 hours in the one case and eight hours in the other case, recover both uh, secret keys from both uh, side of the um, Yeah, so um, as I said, um, the attack is done in a way where the attacker sends a request to the server and then measures the time it takes the server to send a response back. Um, and depending on the question whether the bit that is currently um, that, that, that the attackers want to recover is set to one, uh, is different from the previous bit or equal to it, um, the computation time will be longer or shorter. And this difference in computation time can be measured because the signal, as we will see, uh, is strong enough to um, to infer information about the bits. Um, and if we have um, this anonymous behavior, this misbehavior behavior of the algorithm um, leads to shorter execution time because the algorithm will mainly operate on zeros. Um, and in this case, it means that the, the current key bit is at the oldest of the previous key bit. Otherwise, both bits are equal. In the other case, uh, the mutation time will not be short. And this process is repeated for all key bits, uh, which means that we recover the, the key bits bit by bit. Uh, just a quick over high level overview about the algorithm itself. You don't, you don't need to understand it to pick up. The only important part here um, is this loop where we loop over the, uh, the key M, actually, but like MI refers to bit key bit at index i and m itself refers to what the key the secret key used by the server 
And it's important to know to know that um, the if double and n algorithm is actually an algorithm that first double with the point and then uh Um, if x double and add all of them, um, doubles, the first doubles of one of one, then adds two points to each other. Um, and if the third argument that's provided to this algorithm, if this x2 two, two, uh, argument um, consists of zeros, then the uh, addition part of this function will misbehave and um, return zeros for this computation. And this is exactly uh, the value that is returned by the algorithm. And as soon as um, this zero is set to one, all the subsequent subroutines uh, in the uh, site decapsulation algorithm will also will operate on zeros and only produce zeros for the for the rest of the. And just to give you a notion of why actually. Um, in particular cases, uh, zero is this uh, anomalous zero behavior is triggered. Um, if the attacker manages to uh, choose a ciphertext that uh, contains actually Q and V, I think I did not talk about that. Um, Q and V are points on the elliptic curve that can be extracted from the ciphertext, which means that the attacker can actually. Um, Construct these both points at will because he can construct the ciphertext itself. Um, and if he manages to construct the ciphertext in a in a way in such a way that uh, it's different, that the difference of these two points on the other two term is zero, um, then we will have here uh, the first commutation zero multiplied by whatever, and the second commutation zero multiplied by also whatever, which means that both commutations will return zero. Um, and you can think of it as a sequence of multiplications. And as soon as one factor in this sequence of multiplications is zero, all, uh, all future results will be zero as well. Um, so the, the key itself of the sign algorithm um, has a length of 378 bits. Um, and as I said, um, having extracted the first um, i bits, of or i minus one bits of the key, uh, the attacker can construct the ciphertext for for key bits at index i in such a way that if the current um, the current key bit at index i is different from the um, key bit at index i minus one, then the algorithm will um, reduce anomalous zeros, will get stuck. Uh, the frequency will become higher, the, the bar consumption will become lower, and uh, the execution time will, will be shorter, which can be measured uh, remotely by the attacker. However, um, if uh, the current bit is equal to the bit at the, at the previous index, then no anomalous behavior will be like, no misbehavior should be triggered, and the, the uh, decapsulation algorithm will not take shorter, shorter uh, one time to finish. And it's, it's important to note here that, that this is really uh, like a mere if then question, uh, which means that um, only if um, the uh, only if both bits are different, um, then the ciphertext will trigger this misbehavior. However, if a bit at index i and a bit at index i minus one are not different, then neither neither a malicious ciphertext nor a uh, normal ciphertext will trigger a misbehavior and the, the, the execution time of the algorithm will not change at all. Um, so here it was uh, interesting to know that, uh, for example, for bits, uh, for two consecutive bits, which are different, um, the algorithm uh, took less time to finish the computation because it could run at high frequency as we can see here, for example, um, the, the probability to run at a higher frequency for two bits, the two consecutive bits that are different, is higher than the probability to run on the same high frequency for two uh, equal subsequent bits. And um, uh, also, um, uh, the, the reverse uh, effect can be seen in the power consumption, where we see that the power consumption for two bits that are 
not two consecutive consecutive bits that are different is lower than the fourth position for two consecutive bits that are and not different. Um, just to have some concrete values um, in the experiments the authors did, um, they um, uh, show that a server responds after only after at most 660.2 uh, milliseconds if an anomalous uh, zero behavior is triggered, which means if the current bit is different from the previous bit. And in the other case, the server responds um, after at most. I think at most and at least are very important here. Uh, at most 662.2 milliseconds. And you can see that the, the signal of this variation in response time is strong enough to, um, to uh, conclude whether the, the current bit is equal to the previous one or not. Um, uh, they did, as I said, the, uh, the experiments on two side implementations. And here we have the results for the results for um, the circle library from uh, Cloudflare, um, where we see that there are variations in the response time depending on the uh, on the current bit of the key. For example, uh, if you look at those four bits, since the computation time is uh, low for all of those four bits, we can conclude that this bit, for example. Is different from this one, or that this one is different from this one, this one is different from this one. However, um, for this and this bit, uh, they must be equal because the computation time for the, the computation time for this bit is um, longer, it, it's not anomalous. Um, and this mean, means as soon as you know the or only one bit, the first bit, for example, um, you can exploit this dominant effect and extract the full security bit by bit. Um, so, uh, okay, just a quick look at the uh, uh, attack results. Um, the, 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 the office could extract the full key for uh, the full security key for this type of limitation in. Uh, Cloudflare's circle library in 36 hours and for the Microsoft BQ crypto library in 89 hours. I asked myself whether the execution times were different, but we will discuss that in a moment. Um, they also show that uh, the attacks can be successful and re re reduced for some other generations of CPUs, um, and that um, AMD processes also have a similar leakage model, but. Um, uh, studying the AMD processes was uh, left for future work. So now, since now we have talked about the attack, um, we should also have a look at possible mitigation techniques to prevent this attack or at least uh, um, make it as uh, difficult as possible. And the first mitigation technique was motivated by the observation that um, those anomalous zeros can only be triggered in the algorithm when the cipher texts uh, are um, chosen in a specific way, um, which means that um, if you can make sure uh, before we, we execute the decryption algorithm that the cipher texts were um, constructed properly, we can prevent the, the attack completely. I think this was the mitigation that uh, have been done by Microsoft and um, Cloudflare. Um, it's important to know that the authors reported this vulnerability to Microsoft and Cloudflare, but that um, both companies um, in, uh, employed a mitigation to this vulnerability. And this was the exact mitigation that was deployed um, using, um, so before, before they um, uh, passed the, the ciphertext to the algorithm, they check that the two points we have seen for QRP are linearly independent um, and that they, they are, um, that they cannot trigger this misbehavior in the algorithm. However, this has the drawback that it causes the quite high performance overhead, 5% in circle and 11%. And the second observation um, was motivated by the fact that um, uh, the secret key seems that, that um, the, the steady state frequency, which was actually observed in the attack, 
um, is only entered when a certain thermal limit is hit by the algorithm. And if we can prevent the algorithm from entering this steady state uh, frequency, um, we can close this leakage, uh, this frequency leakage channel completely. So we can simply uh, force the CPU frequency to stay at a fixed uh, frequency. However, um, as, you, as you know, this uh, GBFS is actually used to optimize performance and to finish computations uh, as, um, as efficiently as possible and preventing or deactivating this feature would result in reduced system performance. The third mitigation was um, motivated by the fact that uh, the, the secret key seems to be somehow dependent on the cipher texts that are provided by the client and not by the server. Um, so if this had not been the case, the attackers would not have been possible to construct cipher text in a way that makes it possible to recover the key. Um, in other words, if we can manage to decouple the secret key completely from the, the data um, from the cipher text, and if we can ensure that there is no statistical independence uh, between the two operands, um, we can um, achieve that uh, the security cannot be inferred based on information uh, that included in the software tests. So uh, the first, first and last mitigation is to simply use blinding techniques, which um, modif modify the, the input or the output of the cryptographic uh, algorithms in order to ensure constant time, it's a, a constant execution time, completely independently of the data that's being uh, commuted on. Um, and this comes, however, with the, with the drawback that causes um, an increased computational overhead and high complexity because um, uh, using those blinding techniques might sometimes affect the actual results of, uh, of, of the encryption. Uh, and it's also, also quite challenging to um, to uh, know which flying techniques uh, should be used for specific encryption of things. So um, to sum everything up, we have seen that on modern editing processes, there is this leakage, um, this frequency leakage, uh, leakage model, which um, allows attackers to extract without any physical access to power of measurement without any access to the two power measurement interfaces. We have seen that variation, uh, DVFS reduced variations in frequency depend on uh, the power consumption, and the power consumption again depends on the data. Um, and uh, having variations in uh, frequency uh, can be translated to different differences in execution times, uh, which um, can be exploited as a start of such. Um, we have seen that the full key was successfully recovered, and uh, an important key result here is that um, constant time programming practices need to be rethinked because the site algorithm is actually meant to be in a constant cycle algorithm. Um, however, um, so, uh, due to those variations in frequency that occur in the algorithm, depending on some animal behavior. Uh, the algorithm can still leak sensitive information, even though it's meant to be a constant time or a constant cycle. Either. Now, just a quick overview about uh, strengths and weaknesses I found in the paper. Um, the paper was the first work to present a systematic reverse uh, engineering between um, frequency, data, and power consumption on modern, uh, modern Intel CPUs. It was the first work to observe this Hamming wave and Hamming distance effect we have talked about before to show that those both effects are actually both distinct and additive. Um, it was, it's also uh, important to know that those findings were reported to uh, Intel and Intel AMD and um, Microsoft in Cloudflare. And as I said, um, they employed mitigations to mitigate these attacks. Um, so this kind of shows us that the failure had a practical impact. It's also important to know that the exact same vulnerability was also discovered by a different group of researchers uh, while uh, this um, vulnerability was 
kept being kept under embargo by Intel. And they, um, the group that wrote this paper got a bug bounty from Intel for this time. Um, they, it's also um, um, interesting to mention that all mitigation techniques I've talked about, they were actually suggested in the paper itself. Uh, that they made the source code available on uh, GitHub as a contribution to the open source community. Uh, and I highly encourage you to read the paper if you're interested in our security or frequency side channel attacks because it's really very well written and it, it explains uh, all concepts um, uh, in a very easily understandable way. Uh, so some weaknesses to me personally. Um, the first the use case they are actually discussing the paper seems to be um, kind of too um, too specific because they say themselves in the big uh, in the paper that despite its theoretical power, it's not obvious how to uh, construct practical exploits through the frequency side channel. So um, it seems to be difficult to mount such kind of attacks from a practical point of view. Um, and the second weakness, which is actually related to the first, the first one, is that they only focused on the L in their experiments and they ignored the effects from all other microarchitectural components, such as the cache. Um, because um, they said um, the um, int, uh, CPU processes x86 are highly undocumented and highly complex, um, and it's in almost impossible to examine uh, all effects that might be might occur during the execution of an of a cryptographic algorithm. But however, this is this is obviously a weakness because like uh, it's the complexity um, that uh, lies in modern x86 uh, processors might actually have benefit with respect to such kind of attacks because it makes it more well, more difficult to extract information only based on um, the on response times from server. Um, and as I said, they uh, recovered the, the last 14 bits of the key, not by the remote timing attack, but by use of search attack. And the reason for that is that they found that um, side attacks that are constructed to um, recover bits in early, uh, in like in the, in the early stage of the experiment, but to extract early bits of the key might cause um, the algorithm to misbehave at a later stage. Um, like they might, might cause an unexpected misbehavior of the algorithm. And the, the higher the, the number of the bit index, uh, the more probable this misbehavior becomes. That's why they kind of sidestepped uh, this effect and uh, extracted the last part of the bits um, by a different number. Um, and as I said, the differences in response times, which is which are actually uh, quite significant, we have a difference of almost 40 hours uh, between the attacks for both libraries were not explained at all. Um, they also note that none of the side attacks they uh, construct pass the so called um, Okamoto test, which is a test that is used to um, immunize against uh, frequency side channel attacks to make sure that the ciphertexts that are provided to the algorithm um, have been created properly and uh, consist of two linearly independent uh, elliptic curve points, um, which was actually not having this test was actually one of the reasons that paved the way for the attack to be successful, which means if you would uh, uh, implement this text at the beginning of the algorithm, uh, we would not pass uh, the ciphertexts that were that constructed unproblematic to the algorithm at all, and we would not trigger any misbehavior. They also um, uh, showed that the, they also uh, conducted the same test on two different, two other CPUs from older generations, um, and found that it's not possible to uh, mount such attack on older CPU generations because it was simply not possible to force the frequency to uh, get down to the steady state frequency, which was crucial for this attack to be And if, if you Google uh, is site secure, then this is the first result that you, that you get, which um, was also explained in the paper that shows that site um, 
has some weaknesses that are not related to frequency side channels at all. Um, it has some weaknesses in the math actually behind it. Um, and um, I mean, trying to um, target vulnerability or to show vulnerability in an algorithm that is that's insecure anyway is somehow questionable. So uh, with that being said, that is, uh, that's it for the presentation part of my talk. And uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Okay, then maybe we can move on to the discussion part. How much time do we still have? Okay. I will try to go quite fast over the next question. So uh, the first question I got is um, we have seen four mitigation techniques so far to mitigate uh, these attacks. Can you think of any other mitigation techniques to particularly mitigate frequency such attacks? If you think of, I don't know, constant learning. Which is in this particular case not effective. Okay. Um, I that there is a paper that was published in 2022, um, and that shows that it is um, it, it actually proposes an attack that uses a frequency side channel, and at the same time proposes some mitigation techniques that can be used to mitigate such kinds of attacks. The first technique they propose is to um, keep the system at the lowest possible frequency and prevent it from um, entering state, state frequency or from using DBFS techniques um, or to completely disable reactive limits. However, this has the drawback that um, it would um, violate the safety or would uh, actually have a negative impact on the safety because those reactive limits are usually necessary to ensure that, uh, for example, that the heat generation does not exceed a certain limit. Um, another mitigation um, was to reduce the sensitivity of the production algorithm and to make it less sensitive to the to, uh, to the frequency of the CPU. Another technique was to um, add randomness to the reactive limit, which means instead of using a static reactive limit that is used to, to uh, determine when the frequency should be throttled down to a steady state. Um, we use instead uh, a range, a range of uh, reactive limit, and we randomly pick um, an, an, a value for a reactive limit from this range, um, which enables us to dynamically configure the active limit for and then vary it every now and then for different computations. And this randomness makes it for sure harder for an attacker to uh, infer any sensitive information from uh, the computation. Uh, another possible idea is to simply add noise to the uh, to the power input, uh, or to use a model uh, power uh, consumption, which means instead of using the actual power consumption as input to the throttling algorithm, we model uh, the power consumption and um, instruct this model in a way that it excludes any information about the operands or the instructions that are being executed. Um, and by doing so, we can um, make the encryption algorithm itself completely independent of the, uh, the secret key data and generally the data that's being computed on. Or we can simply uh, um, utilize and inject noise into the cryptographic uh, uh, operations that are um, executed. Uh, however, as I said, uh, this um, negatively affects the performance. And is also quite challenging. So the second question is: um, We have seen that the attacks um, took different times for both implementation, for the implementation of uh, circular and recurring crypto. The first one it was um, thirty-eight hours. For the second one it was um, eighty-nine hours. Can you think of any possible reasons uh, for this for these time variations? Yeah, I would just suggest some uh, reasonable uh, 
reasons that I could think of. Uh, one reason that they uh, explicitly state in the uh, paper without directly relating it to um, to this behavior is that the signal they obtain from the BQ crypto um, library is fainter than the one they obtain from the SQL library because BQ crypto uses a different strategy for Montgomery reduction, which is uh, like which is related to uh, allergy curve that causes the value zero to be represented in memory sometimes as one, sometimes as a prime number of size um, as 751 bits. And since um, when an anomalous uh, zero behavior is triggered, we almost only operate on zeros, um, storing those zeros as prime numbers of such a huge length might be possible for this for longer response time of the system. Another possible reason is that they send a large number of requests to the server to the server of the BQ crypto library than to the other server, um, which means that the server has to handle more requests. Um, it's also um, maybe interesting to know that they, uh, they both servers are implemented in different programming languages. The first one, Go, the second one, in C, and Go is a programming language that is designed to to uh, highly support. Uh, uh, concurrent programming uh, and it actually uses some concurrent programming elements to handle the request in this case. Um, so it might be like the go code might be here more efficient in uh, handling those requests than C code. Um, two uh, remaining very simple reasons might be that the implementations uh, in both libraries are simply different or that the servers use. Um, have different computation capabilities, which can always be the case. And my last question is um, can you think of any other power analysis or treatment to side channel attacks not necessarily related to, um, to side or? Yeah, actually, uh, there have been some in the last few years. Um, I'll just give a quick overview. There was a paper that was published in um, 2003 that shows that uh, remote climbing attacks, as opposed to what was believed before this paper was published, are practical and can be mounted um, even on general purpose computer systems and not only on smart cards or whatever. Um, and this paper, they um, uh, could recover private key from an open SSL web server um, in a quite short time um, using climbing tests. Like they sent to respond uh, requests, uh, decryption requests to the server, they measured the time it took the server to send response back. And similar to what we have seen inside in the hard split attack, they, was, uh, they were able to extract the full key uh, of this uh, server. Another two attacks that you might know are uh, mount down spectre, which uh, exploits speculative execution in modern processors and which mainly target processors that use speculative execution. They were both um, disclosed in 2018. They are actually highly related, but I think the main difference is that spectre, spectre um, targets a broader range of uh, CPUs, CPU models, AMD, Intel, ARM, and so on. And the idea of those attacks were, was that by tricking the processor into speculatively executing instruction to access memory segments that would not be accessed under normal program execution, um, we can um, um, in, we, we can gain hints about the data that are stored in those protected memory segments. Um, and by doing so, um, this can be used as a side channel this uh, speculative execution. Um, yeah, with that being said, if you have any questions, you can take them. Otherwise, um, I'm done with the presentation. Keep in mind that fully secure systems don't exist. This was uh, the first law of security that was established by Eddie Schemmer, uh, one of the founding fathers of uh, public crypto systems. And actually, you never get security for free security. Almost always was at the expense of performance or complexity or usability, and it's always important to find a new balance between performance with your hand and security measures. Um, and it's also always important to keep security considerations in mind when designing computer systems that should be 
as efficient and reliable as, as possible. Many thanks to my mentors uh, who supported me up to the last minute. And thank you very much for your attention for your contribution. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks. The third one. The Yeah, yeah. The new slow thing, the slow song. So the one you sent me, the yeah, one like split this one. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 So the next presentation is uh, it's about uh, tensor fully homomorphic encryption. Uh, the presenter is Jerome Tarakse. Yes, yes. I did my test. <laughs> so, uh, he's a third year bachelor student, computer science, and he's quite interested in cryptography. And he made a really nice presentation. So, yeah. Good. Yeah, let's go. So, welcome to my presentation about tensor FHE, achieving practical computation on. Encrypted data using a general purpose GPU. So, I assume that most of you don't know what FHG means, so we'll start off with a little introduction to that. So, what is FHG? Uh, FHG stands for fully homomorphic encryption, which is basically allows you processing on encrypted data without decrypting it first. And I've prepared a little equation for you to understand it. So, you have your data here. Encrypted locally on the computer, then you can send the data to a cloud, and the cloud does some computation on it. You get it back from the cloud, decrypt it, and voila, you have your process data without knowing how long it was. And this looks also like this. And here you see why it's called homomorphic encryption, because basically, Earth is a homomorphism between your Plain text space and your ciphertext space here in the cloud. You can do some functions on it and it's yeah, switch between the domains with the encryption and decryption function. So now that you know what it is, I want to talk about the applications that you have with it. Basically, you can use it for all kinds of privacy preserving computation, uh, for example, machine learning or private data, where you can take for example, voice data from your voice assistant and train your language model with it without revealing the actual contents of it. Then you can do completely private computation. For example, you have an algorithm which you want to outsource for cloud, but you don't want somebody to read it or if that happens. Or even if you don't trust the cloud provider itself, you can outsource it without problems. Or, for example, private data storage with query support without decrypting, decrypting the data first. But there's only some examples, there are many more things you could think of where you can use it. So, uh, a little history about fully homomorphic encryption. So, homomorphic encryption is quite a new invention. Uh, it's been first proposed in 1978, and the same guys who invented. RSA encryption, and until then, many partial homomorphic encryption scheme existed. So, if you ask yourself what a partial homomorphic encryption scheme is, it's basically 
almost as a fully homogeneous encrypted scheme, but it only supports some operations with which you can do all arbitrary functions that you want to. Yeah, as I said, RSA itself supports a homogeneous encrypted scheme uh, with respect to multiplication. You want to have some subset of operations. So then the first fully homomorphic encrypted scheme uh, was described in 2009 by this beautiful guy here. And it uses some sort of learning with errors and homomorphic rings, which I'll get into later. But it's also quite new invention in cryptography, like a learning with errors thing. And uh, as I said, it's totally complete. You can do anything that you want with it in comparison to partial homomorphic encryption, encryption schemes. So, what is the current state of homomorphic encryption? It's still on research because the current implementations are slow and the slower will be very slow. Uh, the encryption process itself takes long, decryption is a bit faster, but still slow. And the main pitfall is that the computations on the encrypted data are much slower from 1000x to 1 million x up to 1 million x lower than the plain text operations would be. And as you can imagine, this makes it not usable for most practical applications, which is also why you maybe didn't perfect it by now, because it's almost too slow. I don't know at least. So with that said, uh, let's start with the paper itself. So the problem we're trying to solve in this paper is uh, that existing implementations of homomorphic encryption schemes on a GPU are not very efficient. And the natural goal is to increase this performance on the GPU and in its own with software. Then the key idea to achieve this goal is that you that we mitigate the underutilization of current GP, GPU implementations. And we want to increase the overall, overall throughput of the parallel FHE operations instead of increasing the latency of a single FHE operation. Because that is what most prior work try to do, and we want to focus on something different. Then the key mechanism that we're going to use is basically a new algorithm for computing the entity more efficiently. And the entity, I'll explain later what it is. And we want to optimize for emerging hardware because, yeah, we know that you have new hardware, why not use it? And the results are an average 2.61 performance speed up compared to previous GP implementations of new encryption, encryption schemes. Yeah, with that said, I'll give you a little outline of the talk. Yes. Also, yeah, it's continuing. Yeah, you can allow that on top that you can. Yeah. So, first, I give you some more technical background if you didn't have enough by now, because otherwise, you won't understand it, maybe. Then, I'll talk about Tensor FHG itself, what the paper proposes to do. Then, I'll talk about the results. I draw my conclusion. I give you a little critique from my side, and we'll have a nice discussion together, hopefully. Well, let's start with the technical background. So, there are different uh, FHG schemes that exist. Uh, one prominent is the CKKS scheme, which was invented in 2016, and it's one of the newer ones, and we're going to focus on this scheme in this paper. And it uses approximative real numbers, so we won't get exact results with it, but it's still useful for most machine learning applications because you don't have to have 
where we expect uh, results. Then, just for information, there are also other schemes like this one, which is for integer arithmetic, optimized Boolean logic, and we have those two, which are very similar to CKKS. And actually, the tensor energy in, uh, improvements can also be applied to those two schemes because they're so similar. Well, let's start with some little math. So basically, you can think of uh, homomorphic encryption as you take some plain text vector of values, which is yeah, this one. And what do you do with uh, homomorphic encryption and do operations? You basically do CD operations on the components of this vector. So every operation you do, you do on all the values uh, at the same time. Then we encode this vector into a polynomial ring. Yeah, this thing here is a polynomial ring. If you had discrete math, maybe you know about it, but I'll explain it shortly. You have basically your components are set high. So normal not as in this uh, the example numbers, but modulo to by five. And it's a polynomial as a C here, and you divide your whole polynomial by another polynomial. So this is basically a polynomial ring. And now I'll give you some more detailed information about how the encoding decryption process works. To start off with your message again, which has the size, sorry, n divided by 2, where n is the polynomial length of your encoded component. Then you encode it to the polynomial, as I said. You do this basically in a way that you search the polynomial, you construct the polynomial. And the polynomial evaluated in certain x values gives you the components of the vector. So, for example, we say if x1, it should be the first component of the vector, and x2 the second, and so on and so on. Then you encrypt it uh, using the learned errors technique, which is basically you have some secret polynomial, take some random polynomial, and add some random error to it. And the adding of the error makes it. Uh, cryptography, cryptography can be safe. But then also the small error that you add leads to the fact that it isn't uh, exact and you get all the approximate results back. Yeah, then you basically do computations on your cycle text that you have. Decrypt it again using the learned with errors technique and the secret or only key. Evaluate it at the certain X positions and or have your message of computer dot. Uh, yeah, just some abbreviations from the rest of the paper. As already told you, n is the degree of the polynomial, and q is the modulus of the components of the polynomial ring. So now I also want to talk quickly about the number three D transform called NTT, which is basically uh, the discrete Fourier transform over a ring. And as you may know, there exist two ways to calculate the FFT, the Fourier transform, which is on one hand the recursive version of the FBAS Fourier transform algorithm, or you just do a matrix multiplication with the BFT matrix. Uh, yeah, you see here the recursive variant, which has time to time complexity of O n log n, or you can do the matrix vector multiplication, which has time complexity O n squared if I remember right. And also want to quickly talk about the operations of homomorphic encryption, which are not so many. So basically you have addition about multiplication, sorry, between two ciphertexts. You can do multiplication with ciphertext and plain text, like three times with ciphertext. You can do addition between ciphertexts. You can do a rotation of ciphertext, like shifting the bits. And you do, can do a rescale operation. Uh, the rescale operation, I won't go into detail, I think no one wants that. We're running out of time, but rescale is basically you have to do it after each multiplication to get the result correct. And uh, just for those who are curious, curious, 
multiplication and addition together, you can basically evaluate any function that you want. And you can also evaluate the Boolean circuit, so it's too complete. So I hope now we have enough technical background to understand the rest of this talk. If not so, just raise your hand and ask me a question. So what do we want now? Yeah, we want more performance, of course. What else should we want? And how do we achieve this? Uh, basically, the paper applies some previously known techniques to improve the performance. Uh, those two, starting off with the CU number system called RS, which basically decomposes the components of a polynomial using the Chinese reminder theorem, because this makes it easier to multiply large numbers and do additions or yeah. the main uh, reason for multiplication, because our components of the polynomial are normally very big, so it could be like thousands of bits. Doing multiplication with a thousand bit integer number is quite uh, takes a long time. But using the RNS simplifies it, looks like this. Basically, you take the remainders, it's a congruence between the remainders and the normal number, as Chinese remainder theory states. And instead of multiplying the whole numbers, you just multiply those remainders, take the modules again. Which is the O of n times complexity instead of O x squared. And uh, just for information, the bit size of the RNS components and the rest of the stock are 32 bits. Then they also apply a technique called generalized key switching, GKS, which I won't go into detail too, but it's basically key switching itself is used of also of multiplication and rotation. It just just to use it. And yeah, this is basically an improved variable that, which comes in low cost, so it's a win win optimization, which I like. So, with those optimizations done, uh, they observe how the hardware performs by using a, a virtual GPU and observing the various pipelines, those and things. And they figured out that there's an underutilization of the GPU. Uh, the OP density is very low and they run the CTKS implementation with the optimizations done. And they try to improve this. So, is everybody, does everybody know what occupancy is? Yeah. So, I'm going to detail of that. So, now we come to the actual proposals that they do. The first, first one uh, is a hierarchical reconstruction of the composing kernels. Then they invent a new entity algorithm. They optimize the same algorithm to run from the hardware. And they invent the matching scheme for accelerating the memory accesses. So I'll start off with the hierarchical reconstruction. So basically what they did here is, as I told you about the operations before, they found out that you can decompose those operations into smaller subroutines that we see here on the left side, on the right side square. And we already see here that the entity is prevalent at many operations, which is why it's important. But what they do here is now that they compose those operations, they basically instead of running the operation once, like Composing kernels one after another on a thread on the GPU. They dispatch those kernels to the GPU and then you like invoke the kernels separately and store intermediate results in the VRAM, which leads to better hardware usage. Why I don't know, I can speculate about it because the paper doesn't say anything why. But I think regarding occupancy, it's good for occupancy when the workloads are very balanced. So all threads do more or less the same thing and no big if else statements and on exits all the world. This is basically what you achieve with the compose purpose, I think. And then the second thing you want to do as a total, the entity is very important as you saw. 
So what it boosted, of course. And from this, they observed previous uh, implementations, which more or less all of them use the this algorithm, which looks similar to the which basically is the butterfly FFT algorithm in butterfly games. And you could think that it's well not, I mean it's time, time complex complexity of O and log n. What could we do better? Yeah, you can do better because I observed that you have some raw dependencies in the stages, raw is without the right dependencies. So basically, if you wait for stage zero to finish until you can continue with stage one and so on. And the uh, other thing that is a bit of a drawback is that if you do a mod operation after each stage, as you see here, and this seriously impacts performance, as we see in the next picture, because they observed that the the pipeline stalls occur very often. You see here that for three different algorithms, all applying the butterfly structure, we see that the entity owns as 50% pipeline stalls, of which 20% is raw stall, that we see here. And this can be proved. How? Actually, by a very simple idea. Just go to the matrix multiplication again. Use this algorithm, which instead of the FFT algorithm, just use the DFT matrix and then plus the vector with it. Uh, vector being is the polynomial as a vector, the n times n uh, twiddle factor matrix as a point here. And this improvement leads to some uh, good pros of this algorithm. The first one being more data use because the matrix can be used several times because the length n is still the same. And so we can compute it once, use it all the time afterwards, only read it. Then we have uh, achieved a higher hardware efficiency with this algorithm because we can parallelize it better because we don't have so much dependencies anymore. <coughs> And it's also a reduction of expensive modular operations. Uh, and remember, we just take the remainder at the end of the matrix vector multiplication and not after each stage. So we significantly reduce those operations, uh, which is good because GPUs lack efficient modular operations because they're not great for this. But as everything good in life, it also comes with some drawbacks. Uh, the drawback being, that the twin factor matrix that is on the last picture is actually huge, huge. What I mean by huge, uh, normally n, like the polynomial length, is up to 2 to the power of 18 components. This has to be the case because otherwise the scheme wouldn't provide enough security. And n squared ends up being 2 to the power of 36. Entries are for widespread entry, which is a huge amount of space for memory that you can need. You could fit that in a RAM, but maybe in a VRAM or in a cache, so that's quite inefficient. Yeah. And detecting this problem, they also propose a solution. Uh, they apply the Kuhn Taki algorithm, which uh, transforms the equation basically into this equation here. We have now our array uh, made into a matrix of n1 times n2, where n1 times n2 is the polynomial length, and multiply it with those two matrices, which are also constant for the uh, algorithm. And as you could uh, figure out yourself, those two matrices take up much less space than the huge matrix before took. To uh, show you how much space we save, now we have only three times two to the power of 18 components, which is around one megabyte of space that we need. So this even fits into a cache of GPU, makes it way faster. So now that we have our new super algorithm, we also want to use the new super hardware. And by super hardware, I mean tensor core units, 
which is also quite new invention. I think, if I remember right, it uh, emerged in 2017. So, 2017, the first GPUs with TensorFlow units uh, were put on the market. And uh, TensorFlow units are actually thought to be used for machine learning application, but we can also use it for our purpose here. So, a TensorFlow unit is basically a specialized code for doing matrix matrix multiplication, no precision numbers. In a very fast and efficient way. So our TCUs here take two FP80 matrices as input, like the point numbers as input. Now for the floppy point 60 number as output. And if you paid attention and you remember it, components are 32 bit, which is a problem. So what do we do? Uh, we can segment our floppy point 32 matrix of input polynomial vector components into four FP80 matrices. Then multiply them separately and accumulate afterwards, which basically looks like this. Uh, this table shows how you can uh, multiply two 32 bit numbers, but use only eight bit multiplications. So this is what we do. At the end, we end up with way more multiplications than we should do. But still fast because the tensor groups are so fast and we patient that we still achieve the speed up. So the high level overview of our entity improvement algorithm looks like this. We have on the left hand side here stage one, which runs on the QLA core that the course that you use have. And here we split up our matrix into the sub matrices. Then multiply them here, then accumulate them here again, stage three on the computer core, to the dot product, the dot product, I mean the element wise product, with W2, split up again, multiply again on tensor core units, and accumulate one last time. And this is our result there. So we'll see later how good this performs. Then, the last improvement that they do is they optimize the memory layout using a batching scheme, they, how did this only call it. And they basically do this because they do multiple FHG operations in parallel if you use the GPU to use all the hardware. And the kernels that the hierarchical reconstruction that we saw, the kernels they always operate on. Uh, data that is on the same level and uh, level L, I mean, multiple, multiplicative level, which I didn't explain. But you can basically think of it that if you do multiplication of ciphertexts, they have a level associated with them. And if you do multiplications, the level degrades, so minus one. And you can only, so the kernels, they always operate on the same level L. So I want more insight about this. Have some backup slides if you want. So, okay, I just believe you. So, this is the first term layout that they had, which is called BLN. This is basically you have your batch, you have the different levels here in continuous memory areas, and you can basically put them by your batch. Like the ones we want to do in parallel. But this does not perform so well as the kernels always fetch data with the same level L. So, what you have is basically you fetch this one, this one, which are not continuous in memory. And this leads to inefficient usage and because there's no locality in it. So, the layout that they propose here, you basically group the same levels together. Which makes it more efficient to fetch one on memory. And yeah, that's called LB. This is what they have to So that's basically it. So now we'll see how it performs in a comparison to other implementations. So for the evaluation, uh, they evaluated the performance itself. Uh, they looked at the performance of the T kernel itself. 
They looked at the performance of different operations. They looked at the performance of the different beef, uh, using the meal workload. And last but not least, they looked at the energy consumption of the implementation. That's what it wants. So the first the entity optimization. Here they have cancelled FHE okay. to a state of the art implementation of the GP, GPU FHE called QG, I think I don't spell it right, which is a pure tilde GPU implementation. And here we achieve a speed up of 32.3%. Mostly due to reducing the raw source by 18.1%, and the long vacancy stall is by 10.8%. Yeah, you see this here, this picture. Uh, above, we have our implementation, and below, we see uh, the current state of the art. And we use those two, which are quite quick in comparison to the computation time. So, actually, so it's far so good. Now we want to look also at specific operations and real workloads. For this, uh, I'll give you some platforms that they used for comparison. Uh, we have the CPU baseline implementation for the AMD Ryzen, but the high end CPU. Then we have two GPU implementations using different algorithms. Then we have an FPGA accelerated solution. We have four ASIC implementations, which use quite high end manufacturing processes. Also, have see here quite big on chip memory. And we have our GPU, our, our implementation in different variants. We have the NT version, which is this is the butterfly operations as previous work did. Then we have the batching with the improved entity. But using Tinder course, and we have our own implementation using all the improvements. So the results here, looking at different operations, you see that we achieve speed up in all operations. You see in this table, you see that all our tensor energy variations here in both perform better than the latest GPU implementation called the one X. Uh, every aspect here. And what I want to point out is that compared to CPU, without multiplication, we have a speed up of almost 400x, which I think is quite amazing. And can even do better when you look at the addition operation, we will achieve even 600 uh, times speed up. I find it quite amazing. I hope you do too. And now we want to look at the real workloads and see how it performs there in the world. So we do is uh, this using a different machine learning algorithms, which I already benchmarked in previous papers. So they're quite old with machine learning algorithms. And we see here, we can see here that ASICs will be much faster than GPU implementations in common in general. And again, the tensor energy will uh, Perform better than previous GPU implementations. Here we see the table uh, showing the execution times of the workloads. We see here first the uh, CPU, again very slow, achieve uh, even 1600x speed up compared to the, our implementation. Then compared to the ASICs, the board were slow in most operations except one, which is the LR workload. From F1 plus ASIC, but otherwise everywhere is slower. And this by order of magnitude, as we see here, if you look, for example, here at the back bootstrapping, we're like 100x slower than it. Then again, uh, no surprise, again, it's the 100x GPU implementation, we achieve a speed up of about 3.5x with uh, those workloads. So now they also look at the energy consumption, the implementation. And here we have also a high energy consumption compared to the ASICs. 
also by the order of magnitude, I would say, and also in every workload they did. Uh, yeah, that's about the results. And I think here I will draw my conclusion about this paper. So we saw in the results that it's always faster than the previous GPU implementation, which is nice. But I think we saw and we all agree that it's less energy efficient than ASICs and also slower than ASICs almost everywhere. So it does not compete really with ASICs, but in the paper they told that it, uh, it achieves comparable performance to ASICs, uh, everything with the fact that we could have more GPUs and run in parallel. But I would argue that you always also can do it with ASICs and GP with higher performance with ASICs. Yeah, of course, the uh, obvious uh, pro of the GPU implementation is that it needs no extra hardware. Most data centers already have GPUs for machine learning or other applications for cloud gaming. And if new elements evolve, you don't have to throw them away like ASICs. I'm not sure what's better, so I leave it open. I don't say anything. So uh, now to the critique on the paper. I uh, started off with the strengths I uh, figured out. Uh, the first one, I think the paper focuses on an important problem for me, which is accelerating the fully automatic encryption. I think it's also important that the work shows that it's still a topic and maybe inspire all the work to do the same. And I like that uh, it shows how to improve algorithms, not only looking at the algorithm itself in a mathematical way, but also that it's it shows how to improve algorithms by taking a mathematical burst uh, algorithm, but it still performs better on certain uh, hardware. That's what I like. Then the uh, weaknesses of the paper are a bit more. I think one of the main weaknesses is that it's still slow for writing an application, although it's like 2.61x now, uh, more performance on average than the previous implementations, but it's still a lot of way to slow for practical application. So it was the use of it. Then, uh, as I said, it does not repeat basics anyway, in my opinion. I don't know why they put it into the paper. Maybe to feel better, I don't know. Then we also want to criticize the paper writing, in my opinion. I haven't read many papers, but I think I have to say that I have difficulties understanding why the things that did work the way they did. I mean, at some points they described new algorithms, but they never said why the new algorithms improved the pipeline scores. They just said it improved it, but I don't know why. I couldn't figure it out sometimes. And there was also no code available, I searched for it a long time. And I hope that the code will give me insight about how the improvement actually works, but rather, unfortunately. Yeah, so now we have some nice discussions, I think. Do we still have time? So uh, I want to talk a bit more about FHG in the future. So I think FHG is mainly based on two pillars of the path, which we want to improve it. Uh, the first one is obviously we can improve the elements. I can make completely new elements in the CPKS, which maybe are much faster in a way than the previous uh, than the current are. Or we can just continue improving the implementations of the elements that we have as paper does and previous work. And now my question for you would be, uh, which pillar would you choose and why? Yes. I would choose the invitation just because of the engineering. And if anyone else wants to say something, 
Yeah, but I have to agree with you. I mean, of course, we can improve the implementation. But in my opinion, I think at some point we can should, cannot just improve the algorithms enough that it will run fast enough. I mean, algorithms have some uh, limitations which is where we cannot improve anymore with the uh, new hardware. And therefore, I think it's a bit waste of time. I don't know if this makes sense, but for me, it looks like we have time to improve the current algorithms. I think we should focus more on the better completing the algorithms, which maybe are much faster even on the CPU and current implementations. Does anyone disagree? Well, I hope you can understand. So then the second and last question would be um, will FHG ever be sufficiently fast when will it be? I think we should start breaking some random people. You in the back. Just guess. Thank you, guess. I think so. I think that's uh, it should be in order to be stolen or uh, trust for the computing. And it's I think it's just said it is, uh, we already have stolen in work, but uh, in work, it's pushing that stolen uh, and it's a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, it's not in a position that I think it's done. This paper shows that improvements are still possible in this direction. I think that I, I don't know if you can think of any other techniques different from what that can ensure uh, trustful using it in not a trustful device. Yeah, we said it too. Yeah. I mean, it's, we cannot just take something else because if we choose such a you can apply it to so much things that you can do anything other than this. Therefore, this all, all uh, also because by a home, it would be at some point sufficiently fast enough that we can use in the wild. Because, yeah, like I said, nowadays it's just a slow, no one uses it for any practical application. But I could imagine a world where you can use the you know, encryption everywhere on the phone, on um, any, literally anything. And therefore, I really hope it will be sufficiently fast enough. And I also believe that maybe the century will be bit to the real and the point where it's sufficiently fast to use for us. So my guess would be like 100 years. Not a bad. Bad No. Already in vacation. Yeah. So then I also guess. Uh, I want to thanks to thank my uh, mentors. Uh, Mohamed, thanks for having me. And thanks, how long if you listening to this? And yeah, I certainly don't have any questions anymore, but yeah, that would be. Hi, Ismail. Uh, hi, John. Is Luca there? Yeah. Here, but the problem is it's like both of the links are PDF. Let me... Uh, okay. I guess you can copy the link and then convert it to PPT, but I can do it also very quickly. I see. Oh, there is a link in issue over there. Sorry. 